Right. If you want to turn in your Bibles, I've got kind of a <clears throat> foundational scripture for us uh, this morning that is in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. It's on your outline. If you ha Hopefully you got an outline or have access to an outline so you can see it. Um, I see some that are just kind of floating around. If you didn't get an outline, just raise your hand and we'll get you one. I think we've got extras. I see one right there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Anybody don't have one or access to one? Okay, good deal. Great. So you, you got that scripture there in front of you. I mentioned it last week, um, so I thought I'd start with it this week. Um, and I, I want us to talk about, go a little further with the thought that we were uh, talking about last week. We're talking about, obviously, we've talked in this, this series on the dynamic doctrines of the faith. We've talked about the Trinity, God the Father, some of his attributes, and um, now we're in the in the midst of talking about God the Son, and uh, this this passage right here to me is one of the daggers and the ar chief arguments of the, of the Calvinists, who believe that that God has determined everything. You know, it's very similar to Muslim belief, uh, where everything is already set, it's predetermined, it's the will of Allah. And you don't need to worry about it, you know, and that's why some of them live, uh, you know, kind of in Middle Ages type technology and everything else, because they don't advance. They believe already th everything's already predetermined. <laughs> so this passage that we're looking at today, uh, you know, the argument of the Calvinist is, is that, you know, God is sovereign. Uh, we're not. <laughs> that, we're, that we're basically, you know, everything about our lives, all the decisions and choices we make are really a mirage that all of it's already done, it's already decided. Um, but then when you look at this passage in Philippians, you see, you know, their argument is, well, God can't li limit his sovereignty at all. I mean, he's already, you know, he is absolutely sovereign. He's decided everything. Well, yeah, he did limit his sovereignty, didn't he? He has limited his sovereignty. Exhibit A is the passage we're looking at. And we're going to look at the evidence, the further evidence, as we look at uh, this whole topic of Jesus' lifestyle today. Look at the passage there um, before you. He says, Have this mind in, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, though he's God, he's fully God, he did not count, talking about Jesus, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but... He did what? This is the key word right here. He emptied himself. The Greek word is the, the foundation of it is kenosis. And the theologians refer to the kenosis of Christ, where he is God's son and heaven's glory, uh, decided to take off that robe of, of light and put on a robe of flesh and limit himself. Okay, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is an amazing statement, <laughs> isn't it? And it is a complete mystery how that all works out. That Jesus, according to what we read in the Baptist faith and message, you know, fully God and fully man at the same time. <laughs> now, how that works out, I don't know. I, I, we see evidence of it in the scripture. Um, but we do know that God, the Son, limited his attributes of deity, one of which is sovereignty, to become fully man. So if the Calvinist says, oh, no, no, God could never do that. Already did. <laughs> Already did. He did it in the person of Christ. He limited himself so that he was not omnipresent, omniscient, 
or omnipotent, which are those categories that we usually ascribe to God. And yet, even though he wasn't those things, somehow still, only God can live in himself. <laughs> only God can limit himself, right? I mean, he can do anything. Nothing's impossible for God. So, I know it makes your brain cramp to think about this, doesn't it? You know, and I, can't, I, don't, know, I don't understand how it all works out. I'm, I'm not a Calvinist, so I don't have complete knowledge, okay, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> those folks at least seem to have more knowledge than the rest of us, uh, mere mortals. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know how it all works out, but, but you see it, you see it in the scriptures, where sometimes his divinity and humanity um, are side by side in the same passage. Can you think of a passage where you see the humanity of Jesus and at the same time you see this, this power that's only from God, right? Uh, I think of him getting sleepy and tired and he's in the back of the boat, right? Okay, that's humanity, right? And he's asleep and the disciples come and grab him out of his sleep and they said, Master, don't you care that we're about to perish? Why? Because they're in the middle of this big storm. And what does Jesus do? Humanity, he wakes up, but then deity, he says to the storm, Peace be still. Yeah, peace be still. And boom, it happens. And then they're like, who is this? You know? And they come up with the, the you know, conclusion that this is the Son of God, right? Only deity could do that. So you've got it this in the same passage sometimes, this juxtaposition between Jesus' humanity and his deity. And again, I'm not smart enough to figure out how all that works out, okay? Um, but, but there you have it. And so a lot of times when people talk about Jesus, obviously, they want to, to the, you know, we skew things because you know, of threats, that perceived threats, and of course throughout most of the Christian church and even in our day, the threat has been that he's not really God, right? He's not really deity. So most teaching goes out of its way to prove his deity, right? And so I think because of that, and for good reason, because you're trying to fight, you know, heretical ideas, but I, but I also think that now that we're in this new phase of threat, we need to go back and we need to show his humanity, the fact that he did limit himself, okay, as a, as a human being, as a man. So, and the fact that he, of course, identified with us. But, you know, again, we, 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 the fact that he was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that's the main point of the gospel. But I do want us to focus, again, this, this Sunday, on the fact that he lived as a man. Uh, his God-man lifestyle. And I want us to focus on a few of these topics here uh, as, as, we, as, we, as we do that. Uh, but again, I, I mentioned the fact that, you know, that, that when he emptied himself out of this, this passage that we're looking at, uh, he was no longer omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Let me give you a few examples. Obviously... You know, before Bethlehem, he's all those things. Now at the right hand of God, he's all those things again, right? Uh, when he comes back, there's not going to be anything except for that physical body or spiritual physical body that he had here that he'll come back with on that white horse, right? Uh, but there won't be the limitations uh, that, that he had when he was, when he was here uh, as a human being. Now, when we think about uh, omnipresence, for example, um, and omniscience and omnipotence, um, the fact that he wasn't uh, omniscience, the fact is there were some things that took him by surprise, that he was astonished, the Bible says. Uh, for example, remember when the ten lepers were, were healed, uh, only one of them came back and it shocked him, dumbfounded him. He was astonished by the fact there was only one that came back to give him thanks. That's in Luke uh, 17, 11 to 18. 
Uh, there were some things he said he professed that he didn't know. For example, he said uh, there's one big thing that not I don't know, and the angels in heaven don't know. Only the Father knows. What was that? His return. The timing of his return. I'll give you the exact scripture because some of you might be looking at me quizzically and wondering, you know, where is that? Matthew 24, 36. He didn't know, he said, that, right? So omniscience, he, he laid that aside to become fully human. Um, and, of course, omnipresence. I, this is a no-brainer for all of us. I mean, he's obviously, as a physical human being, he's limited to one time and one location, right? Uh, he can't be everywhere. In fact, Mary and Martha were pretty upset with him because he, <laughs> he didn't have that power at that moment. You know, where were you, Jesus? You know, Lazarus was sick and now he's died. You know, you didn't, you didn't come. Um, so he, he, he couldn't be everywhere at all times um, in his physical capacity when he limited himself. And he wasn't omnipotent. Um, when there were some things he couldn't do. Now I know that's a tough one for people because they get freaked out when I say that out loud. But I'll just point you to one scripture. Um, and that's Mark 6, 5. I think I've got it on your outline uh, somewhere. It, it says that he could do no mighty work there. Now he did a few miracles it says. He, he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Uh, verse 6 tells us why. It says, and he marveled because of their what? their unbelief, right? Because of their unbelief, you know, he limited himself in doing a magnificent big-time miracle. Um, and so he was fully God, fully God during this whole time, uh, but with self-limitations, okay? Now, what did Jesus say about the miracles that he did? Who did them, really? He says, God does God does the work, you know, through me. Um, so he had to live like we have to live. That's what I'm trying to say. He had to appropriate the power of God like we have to appropriate the power of God. Um, and so Jesus, who, who's God, became a human being with flesh and blood and bones and hair. And that's what the theologians call the incarnation, carne flesh, in the flesh. He was a real person, not a myth, not a fable, not a nice story. And the reality is, is he, he became a man. Now, what's the main reason he became a man? So he could be our substitute, right? So he could be our substitute. And to be our substitute, he had to be sinless. And that's why we had to have the, you know, uh, Holy Spirit uh, conception and virgin birth. But then also we had to have a life that was lived, which is where we're at now and what we're studying today. He had to live his life in complete obedience to God, didn't he? Like we should aspire to, okay? Um, and don't think that was easy for him, as we'll see later, because <laughs> it wasn't easy for him. There were real temptations. There was the real possibility for him to choose wrongly. Um, you have to believe that for the temptation to be legit. And that freaks us out to think about, right? Um, but not only did he have to live that sinless life to be our substitute, but God also became human in the person of Jesus so we could relate to him. We could identify with him. Because God's all about relationship. I mean, if he wanted to relate to dogs, he'd become a dog. If he wanted to relate to birds, he'd become a bird. But he wanted to relate to us. So he became a person just like us. Um, and how is Jesus like us? Well, let me just look at, at a few things here uh, as, as we think about it. But, I, you know, I was just thinking about when Will, uh, you know, who's now, you know, Ph.D. student in nuclear engineering, but he used to love to play football, and I used to love to watch him play football. But I remember when he first started out, when he was 10 years old, he said, Dad, get out in the backyard with me and, and, and let's, you know, show me some stuff. You know, show me uh, what to do. And, and when I played the little bit of football that I played, of course, I'm such a little guy and you guys are big guys, so you went on and played high school and went on. But 
I just played a little bit in middle school, and when I played, I played middle linebacker. Now, at 10 years old, when he was 10 years old and he was wanting to run the ball, I mean, I, you know, even at 40 years old, whatever I was at the time, I mean, I could have blown off the ball and just completely destroyed the kid because I'm a man and he's a 10 year old, right? Um, you know, now there came a time when the roles reversed because he ended up 6'3 <laughs> and all conference on the offensive line. Um, but back when he was 10, I had to limit my physical ability so that he could practice and learn. Does that make sense? Uh, so Jesus did the same thing as God to become a man. He limited himself. He could have come in and played football like the Incredible Hulk. Can you imagine the green man on the football field? Even what he would do to the Dallas Cowboys? I think that he would be a wrecking crew, you know. Um, or whoever, whatever team you want to name. The Steelers are out of the plows. I can't even talk about them. Sorry, Gary. I mean, you know, we're at home watching Ernie's team now, you know. Um, How about the Cowboys? There you go. There you go. But, I mean, it, it would be, you know, God coming and playing football would be like the Incredible Hulk playing against, you know, 10-year-olds. It just it doesn't work. But he limited himself so that he could identify with us, you know. I mean, he could have come throwing a 500-mile-an-hour fastball, but he didn't. He threw, you know, 25, 30-mile-an-hour pitch, you know, to little leaguers so that they could get it. You see what I'm saying? So, again, this doesn't mean that he emptied himself of his deity. He was still fully God the whole time. And, again, I don't know how that all works out. But we do see the evidence of what Paul is saying here and. Philippians chapter 2. It does mean that he voluntarily limited himself, and I think that's something we need to study and understand. Uh, and I do think it's a great encouragement to know that. Um, and I'm going to show you why here in a minute. I, I mean, again, unless Jesus became one of us, there would be no way uh, for us to follow in his steps. The Bible tells us that's what we're supposed to do, 1 Peter chapter 2, right? Um, but we couldn't do that if we didn't have his example, and his example had to be on our level. And so that's what I'm trying to, to get across today. Now, last time we talked a little bit about his education. You remember that? That discussion, we talked about he grew up in a home with a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, and, and he knew what it was like to have to share. Um, he, he knew what it was like to live in close quarters. He knew what it was like to go to school. Um, again, he would have gone to school in the synagogue there in Nazareth at age six, uh, where he basically had two grades that lasted four years each. We talked about them last time. Remember Beth Safar, which is where he would have uh, memorized the Torah. Remember he told you that rabbi that said we'd get them in school at six, we stuff them with Torah like a what? Y'all remember last time? What? What did it say? Stuff them with Torah like a what? Like an ox. We stuff them with Torah like an ox, the rabbi said. So they learned the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, uh, those first four years. And, you know, we ask our kids uh, to learn the books of the Bible, and by age 10, uh, the, you know, the names of them, and by age 10, they had actually learned the whole of those first five books. <laughs> they memorized most of it, if not all of it. Uh, next grade of Jewish education was Bet Talmud, uh, Talmud, and that was for ages 10 to 14. And here they would memorize the books of history and wisdom and the prophets from Joshua uh, to the Italian prophet Malachi, you know, at the end of the Old Testament. Malachi. Malachi, otherwise known as Malachi. Uh, so, sorry, I thought I'd throw a little humor in there for you. But they, they learned the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures. All of it. And, and you're like, well, you know, they, they had it, you know, mostly memorized. And, and can you imagine knowing the Scriptures that well? You say, well, there's no way my kids could ever do that. They know a lot of stuff that they want to know. Like I said last time, they know all the lyrics to their favorite songs, and they know the box scores and stats of their favorite athletes, and they know all the, the levels and the different, uh, you know, of their favorite PlayStation or Xbox games. 
They know what they want to know. It was amazing what that day and age, what they did with learning the scriptures, because they, they saw the scriptures as the be all end all. This is what we got to know, right? And that's what they did. That was what was important to them. So the, to the Jews in Jesus' day, the scriptures were the most important thing. It, it, it's not a matter of ability. It's a matter of what we think is important. A matter of priority. Not ability, but priority, right? I, that's the way it was back then. Well, during Bet Talmud, remember we talked about the fact that that was, um, they, they kind of went further with it. They didn't just learn the text itself, but they also learned how to process it by doing questions and answers. Remember, the, the rabbi would ask a question and the respondent wouldn't just wrote memory, spit it back, but the respondent would reply with a question to show that they'd processed, right? So that's why when you, hear, you see Jesus in interaction with the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, Many times they'll ask him a question. What does he do? How does he reply? Back with a question. He said, why did he do that? Well, that's how they learned to do it in school. Right? This is the kind of education that he had. And so that's where he was, you know, in his life. When at age 12, he's in the temple. They can't find him. They're a day's journey away. And they figure out he's missing. Remember, we talked about that last week. So, these scripture scholars were amazed at him as he's sitting there. Hillel, Shammai, Gamaliel, all these luminaries in the Jewish uh, rabbi universe are sitting there peppering this kid from a hick town with questions, and he's coming back with questions that are blowing their minds. They can't, they're like, who is this kid? Where did he come from? How did he get that kind of understanding? Well, he got that understanding the way we're supposed to get that understanding. He identified with us in his education in that we have the same cognitive ability to memorize scripture and process it as this human being, who was 12 years old, blowing their minds, did. Now, I know this is kind of messes with your head a little bit, doesn't it? But these scripture scholars are blown away. But Jesus grew up in a family. Jesus went to school. So when you're having a pity party saying, nobody understands what I'm dealing with at home, and, you know, uh, with all the struggles I've got or at school, just add two words, like Jesus. Nobody understands. Oh yeah, like Jesus, because he does understand struggles at home. He does understand struggles with school. He understands. He identifies. And then his occupation. Okay? Just think about your job for a second. You know, think about what you do professionally. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus identifies with us in what we do for a living? You ever thought about that? You ever considered the fact that Jesus spent more time in the marketplace than he did in his ministry? I, you're blown away right now, aren't you? You're like, what? <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. It's surprising. Yeah, I mean, he spent more time working a job like we do, than being an itinerant uh, prophetic rabbi for three years. I mean, look, for example, the biblical witness, I, I don't want to just make these claims and not give you the underpinning in Scripture. If you look at the Scripture on your outline, it should be Mark 6.3. Do you see it there? It's a very simple statement. Mark 6.3, they ask the question, these are the people there in Nazareth who don't believe him, because they said he's, you know, we know this kid. He grew up with us here. You know, we know his brothers and his sister and his mother. Isn't this the what? Carpenter. Present tense, by the way. At this point, he's still working as a carpenter. Okay? 
Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that he took up the trade, followed his, in his uh, earthly father's footsteps. Now, there was one more stage of Hebrew education, by the way, and that was Bet Midrash. And that was after age 14. But it was by invitation only. So these, these rabbis, as they were you know, watching their students go through Bet Safar and Bet Talmud, they were evaluating. Okay? Uh, they were deciding, okay, who's fit for this next stage that is by invitation only. And apparently, Jesus didn't make the cut. And when people didn't make the cut with the rabbis, they were told to go ply their trade, go learn your father's business, and Jesus didn't make the cut. Obviously, he didn't give the teacher the answers that he wanted to hear, was intimidated by him, probably. Uh, so they sent him home at age 14 to join Joseph in the carpenter shop. Have you ever been turned down on a job? Ever been turned down for a position? You ever been turned down uh, for something? Ever been told you you're not good enough? You didn't make the cut? You don't measure up? And thought nobody understands? Add the two words. Like Jesus. Right? So he became a carpenter's apprentice, and as the eldest, he took over the business when Joseph died. We're not told when he died, but apparently somewhere along the way he did. Um, but Jesus understands. Jesus understands what it's like to lose a parent. Jesus understands what it's like to have responsibility for the whole shooting match on his shoulders. with you where you're at. We, again, we get this picture of Jesus walking four feet off the ground in stained glass colors. He's lived where you live. In every respect. Including your job. Right? And so he, he becomes a carpenter. Now back in biblical times, a carpenter, a little bit more than, than a guy that was handy working with wood. Okay? Uh, Carpenter not only responsible for the woodwork, he's responsible for the excava excavation work, for the foundation work, and to finish out a project. Think part carpenter and part construction worker, okay? Mike, you, you know all about that. <laughs> right? Yeah? He was a civil engineer. Yeah, civil engineer, there you go. I mean, he had the whole skill set, you know, all in one guy. Uh, we, we got this whacked out view of, of Jesus you know, from some of the artwork that he was some pale, frail, wimpy guy like Mr. Rogers in a blonde wig <laughs> with blue eyes and a blue Miss America sash over his white robe to match. <laughs> Don't we? I'm not kidding. Seriously, that's what we have of Jesus. But this dude, you know, he would have been bronzed by the sun. He would have he would have been, had thick dark hair, and he had to be strong, thick muscular fingers and arms and a strong back and sturdy legs. He was a working man, a man's man, Jesus. Amen. Not Mister Rogers in a blonde wig. No offense to Mr. Rogers, he's a nice guy. You know what I mean, though, okay? But he, he knows all about stress and pressures. He, he knows all about deadlines. Uh, he knows all about billing disputes. He knows all about dealing with all kinds of clients and customers and the satisfaction of a job well done. He's been there. He's been there. Don't you see the genius of God and the brilliance of God and the wisdom of God? Limiting himself, emptying himself, becoming one of us so that he can identify with you where you live in what you do. My translation said he made himself nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, nothing. A bond slave, it says. 
Man, and, 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 you know, have you ever had moments of whining about your job? Yeah, <laughs> seeing some side eye happening now. So, you know, surely you do. I mean, nobody understands what I'm going through at work right now. The people I have to deal with. Nobody understands how hard my job is. Nobody understands. Wait, add the two words. Like Jesus. <laughs> you see? Well, his temptations, too. His temptations. Another area to think about when I think of Jesus identifying with us is temptation. The Bible says Jesus was tempted. I just gave you the short version there at the top uh, of that segment. Uh, you know, Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Spirit drove him out in the wilderness, and he was with in the wilderness 40 days. What? Being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, Matthew 4 and Luke 4 give us the extra, right, of this. They give us a more full account than Mark does. Um, and in Matthew's version, you remember that Jesus had been fasting for how long? 40 days, right? And so he's hungry, the Bible says. And so how does the devil tempt him? Comes in and he says, why don't you turn these what? These stones to bread, right? Turn the stones to bread. But that's a representative temptation. It's a momentary temptation. But it's also a representative temptation of other temptations he faced later in his ministry. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 15... He fed the 4,000, right? Fed the 4,000. Um, and there's three passages that line up with these three temptations in the Gospels. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but this is part of what I did my PhD dissertation on, is the fact that the order of the temptations in Matthew 1, 2, 3 match the order of similar temptations, so to speak, that happened later in the ministry of Jesus in the same order in Matthew. But in Luke, you'll remember that the last two are reversed. Have you ever noticed that? That there's turn the stones to bread, jump off the pinnacle of the temple, we'll look at it in a minute, and then kingdoms of the world. Remember that high mountain, kings of the world? That's Matthew. Luke, it's stones to bread, kingdoms of the world, and pinnacle of the temple. And interestingly, the, the gospel writers who had some freedom under the Holy Spirit's guidance um, had that freedom to change order a little bit, you know. But they also have later in their gospels passages that are thematic that line up with those. Okay, so you've got um, stones to bread. Turn the stones to bread. Now, what did Jesus do with the, with the multitudes? He fed them. Now, what did the multitudes want to do as a result? John tells us in chapter 6, they wanted to make him king. So Jesus was tempted to get a following and be a Messiah that was a welfare Messiah. You know, people will follow you, Jesus, the devil was trying to tell him. They'll follow you if you'll feed them. They'll follow you. And Jesus was having none of it. They tried to make him king in John's Gospel. He was having none of it. He, he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. What does he say to the devil here? It's interesting. Again, this goes back to his training in school. How does he reply to the devil? Turn these stones to bread. What does he say to him? He pulls Deuteronomy out. And he says, live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Right? So he, he replies back with Scripture. And then, if you go with Matthew's version, he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, tempts him to do what? Throw yourself down, jump off. And now he gets sneaky. He pulls out Scripture, right? Psalm 91, he says, you jump off and, oh, God will take care of you. He'll send his angels to scoop you up so you don't even stub your toe, Jesus, right? But then Jesus replies back with Scripture, doesn't he? Uh, you, should not, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But now, essentially, the devil wanted him to do a great sign and a great wonder. So if you read Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 15 kind of ends up with the feeding of the 4,000. What does chapter 16, verse 1 say? 
what are the Pharisees tempting him to do? Do you see it? Show us a sign. Do you see how it lines up? Jumping off the pinnacle of the temple, that would have been a sign. Am I right? Show us a sign, Jesus. Be a sign, a wonder-working Messiah. You get a following that way, the devil wants him to get away from the cross. Be a welfare Messiah. Feed them bread, they'll follow you for that. Don't go to the cross. Be a sign-working Messiah. Jump from the pinnacle of the temple. Everybody will follow you if you do that. And he says, no, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So he said no to the demand for the sign. Remember that? It, Jesus replied, verse 4, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign is going to be given to you except the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the well for three days. And where was he going to be? In the earth for three days, right? <laughs> Before the resurrection. And the final temptation. He takes him to the high mountain, shows him the kingdoms of the world, told him he could have it all if he'd do one thing. What? Fall down and worship the devil. Fall down and worship Satan, right? Um, you could be a world leader, dictator, monarch, king. You could be a world king. King of the world, Jesus, if you'll just fall down and worship me. Now, what were the Jews looking for at the time? A king like David to come in and kick butt? Kick the Romans out? Put his boot on their neck? a world leader and then you keep reading in Matthew 16 and what is Jesus doing after the demand for the sign from the Pharisees Jesus is with the disciples they're by themselves he says who do men say that I am and then he says who do you say that I am and then the Spirit of God inspires Peter and he says you're the Christ the Son of the Living God and then Jesus immediately tells him what is it what that's going to mean immediately Verse 22, uh, he, he tells them that, that you know, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die at the hands of sinful men, I'm going to raise on the third day. But in verse 22, what does Peter say back in reply? He was inspired by the Spirit of God to begin with, now he's inspired by another spirit altogether. Who is speaking when he rebukes him? Who is speaking when he says, oh no, Lord. This should never happen to you. You can't go that way. You're not that kind of Messiah. You're going to be a king like David. You can't die. And what does he say, Jesus, in reply to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. That was Satan's temptation. Avoid the cross and be another kind of Messiah. Be the world-ruling Messiah, right? And that's kind of the idea that Peter and the disciples had. He's going to come in, kick butt, take over. Right? A military monarch, a Messiah like King David. But it wasn't God's way, which was the cross. Now, Jesus, as God, could have blown away the devil on the spot. But he faced Satan as man. Just like we have to. And what was his weapon? The Word. Right? Right? The word that he learned in his childhood. And he comes back three temptations, three times. It is written. It is written. It is written. You get the same sword on your hip. Well, most of you have it in your hands or on the table. <laughs> it's a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so like Aragorn and you know, Lord of the Rings, pulling that broad sword out and, and working woe on those orcs. Pull that sword you got out and run him through when he tempts you, just like Jesus did. Where are you tempted right now? Where are you tempted? Tempted to cut corners? Tempted to lie to cover up something that's embarrassing? Um, exaggerate something on your resume to get ahead? Tempted to be unfaithful? Tempted by pornography? Tempted by drugs? What area of your life are you being tempted right now? You might say to yourself, nobody understands where I'm at. Nobody understands the force of my temptation. Nobody understands what I'm dealing with. This is too much for me to handle. Nobody understands. Add the two words. 
<laughs> like Jesus. Right? He does. He understands the temptation you're going through. What does the Bible say? He was tempted at every point, just like we are, and yet without sin. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Hebrews 4.15. I put it on your outline, just so you would have it. Right there it is. So Jesus was tempted just like we are. We don't serve us. We're in a detached deity that wasn't touched by our temptations. He knows everything we're going through. And you know why he can help us? Because he was successful. He navigated every temptation successfully and did not sin. In fact, you know, it says here in Luke's version, I, I love the way Luke's version closes up the temptations. He said he didn't tempt him anymore, but he waited until what? A more opportune time. <laughs> that wasn't the end here in Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 4. No, no, no. No, he's being tempted all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. He's on the cross. They're saying, come down from that cross and prove you're the Son of God. He's being tempted all the way till he gives his last breath. You say, well, nobody understands my temptations. Oh, yeah. There's one who does. Nobody understands like Jesus. And not only that, he'll help you. Look at the scripture I gave you, Hebrews uh, 2.18. Well, there's the ability, Luke 10.19. He's given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions, overcome all the power of the enemy. How much is all? All. <laughs> so you can overcome it. And then in Hebrews 2.18, he himself was tempted in that which he was suffered. Uh, he was able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Remember that word aid. It's a picture of a mother running to the cry of her infant and being able to help that baby. It's awesome. And when I'm tempted, when you're tempted in any realm, all you got to do is cry out to Jesus. Jesus is going to come running to help you. He's going to come and help you. And you know, the scripture tells us there's never anything that we're going to face in life that's too much. Right? Too much. I'm giving you scripture. You remember it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. There is no temptation taken you. I can keep going, but you know the scripture, right? He provides a way of escape uh, for every temptation to come. So 24-7, we come to the throne room of God uh, by our high priest Jesus himself and get help from somebody who's been there. Nobody understands like Jesus. And then his relations. His relations, you know, with God. He had to develop a relationship with God when he came as a baby. Isn't that funny? Isn't that weird, strange to think about? Uh, but he did. Remember it says there in Luke 2.52, we looked at it last time, that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in what? He grew in favor with God? What? How could God grow in favor with God? I don't know! <laughs> I can't explain all of that. But he limited himself. He became a human being. And so he had to grow in his relationship with God. Um, and so, you know, the same way we do. Now, one way we've looked at by the study of the Word. We looked at the study, how he studied the Word, and that's how he defeated temptation. So he learned to walk with God by studying the scriptures. Uh, but have you ever studied the prayer life of Jesus? It's intense what he did. He depended on the Father in prayer just like we do. Look at the examples I've given you. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And then Luke chapter 5. News about him spread over uh, all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him, and, and he healed uh, their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And then this is this one, the next one, Luke six twelve. Look at that. One of these days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the whole night praying to God. Look at his prayer life. He said, well, how did he do the miracles he did? How could he speak with the words of wisdom he did? How, did he, how could he do, you know, how could he do all that he did as a human being? He appropriated the power of God through prayer. 
just like we need to, right? Have you got an important decision to make? Some hard task in front of you? Do you pray about it? Like this? Jesus praying about his disciples. Who he's going to pick? He spent the whole night praying about that. How much do you pray about the decisions that you have to make? Well, how much did Jesus accomplish apart from prayer? Well, look at what he said there in John 15, uh, 5, 17, and 19. He said, My father's always at work to this very day, and I too am working. I tell you the truth, the son can do how much? nothing by himself. Do you see how he limited himself? How he emptied himself? He couldn't do anything except appropriate it from God. He can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father's do, Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does. Jesus did nothing apart from the power of God appropriated by prayer. And then you, you read about his spiritual growth in Hebrews 5. Uh, 7 to 10. In the days of his flesh he offered up prayers, supplications, loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. Why? Because of his reverence. Uh, although he was a son, he, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience. What? Yeah. Jesus learned obedience. Jesus grew in favor with God. Just like us. Like we have to. Okay? Um, his relationship with God. I could spend hours on that. Right? I don't have but five minutes. So we'll move on. Uh, and with family. We already talked about it, How they misunderstood him. Remember? John chapter 7. His brothers taunted him about his... This Messiah business, it says his, his brothers didn't even believe in him. Mark chapter 3, I mentioned this last week. Uh, they came to get him because they thought he, he was crazy. Look at that scripture. It says when his family, and this is including Mary, okay, because in context, you'll read it, you'll find she's in the bunch. When his family heard about this, they wanted to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Ever felt misunderstood in your relationships? So nobody understands where I'm at right now with all this that I'm dealing with. Add the two words. <laughs> like Jesus, right? And then with people. He saw potential in people. He saw Simon, which means unstable. And what did he call him? Peter, the rock, right? Cephas, the rock. Um, you know, he looked at people who were hurting or harassed or helpless. And how did he look at them? Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. He looked at the crowd's with compassion. Um, he took time for every individual who presented themselves with a need. Remember he was going through the crowd, he's trying to go to heal Jairus' daughter when a woman who's had this issue of blood for years and years and years touches the hem of his garment. So long in fact that Jairus' daughter died. But he took care of that too. Anyway, uh, but he stopped for everybody. He had time for everybody, right? I mean, he stopped for people. He personally interacted with people. Um, you know, just just look at, at how he took time. With, uh, and, and what did he like? What jazzed Jesus? You remember? The centurion. And seen faith like this in all of Israel. Or the Syrophoenician woman. He said the same thing. Obedience. When the disciples came back in chapter 10 after going out on the mission... He exulted. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit he, he, because of their obedience. And he said, again, but don't, don't, don't get too carried away with what we, the demons being subject to your name, but rejoice that what your names are written <laughs> above, right? Um, but what did he hate? He hated hypocrisy. He, li he hated a lack of compassion and mercy. He hated the merchandising of the ministry. Seems like he turned over tables of the temple because of that. I mean, he had emotions like we do. And of course, just to walk through the gospel shows how quickly Jesus could build relationships with people. Whether he was talking uh, you know, with the woman at the well, started with a surface conversation about water, and he went deep with her in an instant. Or whether it was a religious leader in the dark of night, like Nicodemus, right, where they end up talking about being born again. Or, or whether it was, you know, 
Matthew and his tax office, or these fishermen by the lake. Within a few moments of conversation, he went deep with them, and they were willing to become intimate with him relationally. I mean, he would accept almost anybody's invitation to dinner. I think I put that in there with Matthew, right? And Matthew's, the dinner at Matthew's house, and all these sinners come, and all the Pharisees are mad because he's relating with these people. And then he had friends, too. The three James, John, there at the Mount of Transfiguration, with those were the inner circle. He said those are the ones he wanted to pray at Gethsemane. But he also had Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I mean, these were close to him. He says, the Bible says he loved these people. So he had close friends as well as, you know, the 12 disciples. Um, and so, you know, how did he show his love? Well, we, you know, we've seen it. I mean, it says there in John 13, he takes his clothes off. There are the disciples with dirty feet. Nobody's thought to wash anybody's feet. And he's the one that takes off his robe and puts on a towel and gets out the basin and washes their feet because it says he loved them to the end. Loved his friends, right? And then his experiences that he had, all kinds of experiences. Think about the pain. That's something we can identify with. Are you going through pain right now? The Bible says that Jesus was hungry. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, the Bible says he was tired. The Bible says he was angry. The Bible says he was down. He was discouraged by some things, like when he, you know, looked over Jerusalem and wept over the city and said, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathered his chick, but he would not. And then he wept, of course, at the tomb of Lazarus, the shortest verse of the Bible. Can you identify with that? That's, that's our life, isn't it? That's what we go through in our experiences. Maybe you're dealing with some kind of physical pain or phys physical illness. Jesus identifies with you. He knows what you're going through. Isaiah 53, penned 700 years before Jesus came, said he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And then it goes on to say that he took all of our sin and all of our iniquity on himself. Jesus is identified with you and with me to such a degree that he became sin. He took our rebellion, our guilt, our pain, our sin, everything we've done wrong, thought wrong, everything we will do wrong, everything that's bad in our lives. And he took all that on himself. We don't deserve it, but he did it. And that's how much he has identified with us. God knew all about the cosmic chasm that's between us and Him. He's holy, we're sinful. And in His plan, He didn't just think it up when Adam and Eve blew it, but in His sovereign plan, again, how this all works out, this sovereignty, free will, I don't know, but it's there. <laughs> in His sovereign plan, He knew we would blow it, and He already had the plan in place, and the plan was to send Jesus to experience humanity just like us and yet be successful in living a sinless life on his way to taking our place and our punishment on that cross. The Bible says that Jesus was 100% without sin, 100% righteous. And that's something perfect. And because he was 100% righteous, he was voluntarily nailed to a Roman cross and that sacrifice was accepted by God. And we know that because there was a resurrection. <laughs> Three days later, God says, I accept that for the sins of humanity. So when I identify with Jesus and I receive him, I find my identity in Christ and the righteous essence of Christ is then imputed into my life. So that when God looks at me, he doesn't see Kenan the sinner and Kenan the foul up and Kenan the mess up, but he sees his perfect son, Jesus. And this whole thing plays out in his 
humanity while he's still deity. <laughs> his salvation and his identification. That's why Paul says the scripture we read to begin with. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus though he was in the form of God didn't count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. There may be nobody in the world in our circle of relationships understands. There's one who does if we're connected with him, and that is Jesus. Thank you that he understands us in our family relationships and our work, our temptations, our experiences of life being a human being. Yet he wasn't touched with sin. God, thank you. Thank you for his identification with us. God, thank you for the encouragement that that brings. That we look at the Christian life and we say, oh, it's impossible. We can't even begin to think about living that life. And it is impossible. We, we read in, in John 15 where it says, without me you can do nothing. We get that. We got to do it the same way Jesus did it when he emptied himself. We got to appropriate the power from you. But there is possibility there <laughs> because of what he did in blazing the trail ahead of us. So we thank you for that. We thank you for that encouragement, Lord. And we pray that we would appropriate your power to live a life that honors Jesus in this new year. In his name, amen.